One of the interesting things about some of these next-gen distributed SQL databases is that there's a concerted effort to make them feel as much like traditional databases as possible from the developer perspective. This is a SQL schema for a blogging application. We have an entries table for blog entries, a users table to store users, and a comments table to store comments made on blog entries. This is what it would look like to create those tables using vanilla Postgres 16. The equivalent table creation code for these distributed SQL databases looks pretty close to identical, if not completely identical. But the potential benefits you get are pretty nice. We're gonna look at all of this from the point of view of a Rust application. The other thing is that both of these next-gen databases that we're gonna look at are wire compatible with Postgres. That means any library or tool that can integrate with Postgres should be able to integrate with these databases as well. It also means that we can use my favorite Rust crate for interacting with SQL databases, which is SQL X. I've been an avid fan of PostgreSQL and DynamoDB for a long time, and you could kind of say that they sit on extreme opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of query flexibility and scalability. Do these next generation distributed SQL databases provide a nice middle ground between those two extremes? Are they so good that we can just go with them and not even consider key value stores or traditional SQL databases anymore? Let's find out. On top of that, there are two competing distributed SQL databases that both offer similar features and they each have dedicated pages explaining why they're better than the other. We're gonna take a look at both. Let's back up for a second and talk about what we're building here. This schema is for a very simple hypothetical blogging platform where we have a table for users, a table for blog entries, each of which is associated with a user. Then we have a comments table, which are comments that users have made on a particular blog entry. The access patterns that we want to focus on for this application are pretty much what you'd expect. We want CRUD operations for entries, retrieval of entries and comments, and so on. But another thing that we want is the ability to do full text search of entry contents using some keywords. But even more importantly, we might not know about all of our access patterns when we're first building this thing. You could probably develop a DynamoDB schema to handle the access patterns we've identified. You might have to do some schema acrobatics, but you could do it. Getting full text search might be a headache though. You'd have to pipe all the data to a specialized search engine like Elasticsearch to get that. DynamoDB unfortunately doesn't have full text search. Also DynamoDB schema designs depend heavily on access patterns. So it's definitely possible to design yourself into a hole that precludes some future access patterns that you might need. The query flexibility of a SQL database would help in adapting to any new future access patterns that we need to accommodate. But something like vanilla Postgres can make certain types of scaling pretty difficult. Scaling read capacity is pretty straightforward with Postgres. Just make some replica nodes and load balance requests across all those nodes. But things can get a little more tricky when your data no longer fits on a single host. You'd need to apply a sharding strategy, something that can be pretty challenging with Postgres. It's also hard to scale up write capacity. When you add replica nodes, you get the ability to handle more read requests, not necessarily more write requests. And that's where distributed SQL databases come in. They offer the query flexibility of SQL along with the automatic scaling and sharding that something like DynamoDB would give you. At face value, that seems like it might be a little too good to be true, so let's dive into it. But let's talk about SQLX first. It's a Rust crate for interacting with various SQL databases like SQLite, PostgreSQL, and MySQL. Since both CockroachDB and YugabyteDB are Postgres wire compatible, we can use SQLX's Postgres capabilities to query them. This is what it looks like to do a simple query against a vanilla Postgres 16 database with SQLX. In this case, we're just getting all blog entries for a specific user. Notice how the results are getting automatically deserialized into this vector of entries. In this case, we're able to do this because we've annotated the entry struct with derive from row, which basically gives us the ability to automatically deserialize any result with column names that match the field names of the entry struct. That's pretty nice. Again, this is the vanilla Postgres version. Now let's take a look at the CockroachDB version. Just kidding, it's exactly the same. The YugabyteDB version is exactly the same too. That's pretty nice because if you're familiar with SQL, there are no new query languages to learn. And if you're migrating existing code from vanilla Postgres, there's a chance that you might not even need to change your queries. This is what it looks like to insert a blog entry. I couldn't find a way to automatically serialize an entry struct into an insert query, but fair enough, SQLX is not an ORM after all. We have to write the query with special tokens, $1, $2, and so on, and then put the values to interpolate into subsequent arguments to the query macro. Check this out though, this is kind of the crazy part. When you use this query macro, it actually type checks the type of the interpolated values and validates at compile time they can be serialized into the fields that you're putting them in, taking the types of those columns into account. That's pretty impressive. Again, that's at compile time, not runtime. One way to think about SQL X is that you as a developer are directly constructing the queries as opposed to using an ORM where you might just say, hey, I have this struct 
and I want it saved to the database, write this query for me. CORM is one of the most popular ORM crates and for good reason. It can make database integrations a bit easier to manage. The nice thing about managing the queries yourself though is that you have more visibility into and control over what's actually going on. When you need to start troubleshooting something, you can just copy and paste the queries from your code and start running them manually. With ORMs, yeah, maybe it makes the code a little easier to write, but there's another layer of abstraction that you have to manage. Sometimes that layer of abstraction is worth it though. It really depends on the use case. That brings us to SQLX migrations. And if you're not familiar with migrations, they're just SQL scripts that define how to create and remove your tables. SQLX has a command line utility for creating and running migrations. You can install it using this command. In this case, we need different migration scripts for each of the three databases we'll be testing out. Postgres, CockroachDB, and YugabyteDB. So we'll run a SQLX command to create migration files for each of those cases. We'll have them each in their own corresponding directories inside the migrations directory. Again, for this simple use case, this is where all the differences are when comparing these three databases. We saw that the basic insert and select queries are identical across Postgres, Yugabyte, and Cockroach. This is the vanilla Postgres 16 version. Nothing crazy going on here. We just have three tables, each of which defines a primary key and some foreign key that refers to the other tables. This is the Yugabyte DB version for the same table setup. The main difference is that we don't have this get random UUID function. So we have to add this UUID OSSP extension so we can call UUID generate v4 which is similar. Different, but not substantially different from the vanilla Postgres version. The reason for this is that at the time this video is being made, Yugabyte DB is Postgres 11 compatible and get random UUID was added in Postgres 13. More on that in a minute. Now this is the CockroachDB migration. Because CockroachDB emulates the Postgres 13 feature set, we have the get random UUID function and the migration winds up being exactly the same as the vanilla Postgres 16 version. That's interesting. Now let's talk about some of the features of these distributed SQL databases. The first feature is automatic sharding. And you could argue that it's kind of the main benefit of these databases. Your tables get automatically split up and distributed across multiple nodes, which has two main benefits. Number one, it improves the volume of reads and writes your database can handle. And two, it ensures that your data can grow indefinitely and not be constrained by the amount of storage space available on a single node. Both Yugabyte and Cockroach aim to be as compatible with Postgres as possible from a developer perspective, but they're quite a bit different underneath the surface. CockroachDB doesn't actually leverage any of the Postgres code base. It was actually written from scratch in Go, despite having an interface that mimics Postgres. In contrast, Yugabyte DB is actually built using the Postgres code base as a starting point. All of its sharding and scaling capabilities are built on top of that. Now, I won't speculate as to which is the better approach, but I suspect that each has its own advantages and disadvantages depending on what you're trying to achieve. At the time I'm making this video, Yugabyte DB is still based on Postgres 11, which is getting a little dated now. Again, Cockroach isn't actually based on any specific version because it doesn't actually use any of the Postgres code base. But at the time this video is being made, it aims to mimic the interface of Postgres 13. That's not to say that it does so perfectly, but from my brief testing, everything I tried with vanilla Postgres seemed to work with Cockroach as well. For most people, the version difference between 11 and 13 might not matter, but it actually might be a big deal if you need something that was introduced in Postgres 12 or 13. Yugabyte does have an active project to rebase onto Postgres 15, something they've demoed and written at least one article about. So it's ongoing, but I don't know when it will be available to the public. In terms of performance, there seems to be some dispute over which is better. Both companies have their own perspective on who's faster, whose tests are valid or invalid, who is more Postgres compatible and so on. I didn't investigate any of these claims. I don't have enough data to do meaningful benchmarks, but feel free to grab some popcorn and delve into the details if you want. Since it's such a frequently needed feature, let's talk about full text search. Like vanilla Postgres, you can get full text search with both Yugabyte and Cockroach. Just set up a dedicated column and index and you're good to go. This is how you'd set that up in Postgres and Cockroach. Basically, you'd add a generated column to store a vectorized version of the content of the entry that's automatically populated whenever records are inserted or updated to the table. Then we create a special index on that column to allow for more efficient lookups. You can get full text search with Yugabyte, but the approach will differ a bit because we need to use a generated column in the Postgres Cockroach version, and generated columns were introduced in Postgres 12, at the time this video is being made, again, Yugabyte is still based on 11. Okay, here's something I had no idea about before looking into these databases. Let's talk about time travel. CockroachDB has this really interesting feature called point in time queries, and they look like this. You suffix your query with as of system time, followed by an absolute or relative time. And this allows you to query your database in the state that it was in at some arbitrary point in the past. 
I thought that was really cool. The window of time you can query is known as the time travel window, and it's configurable. The minimum value is one hour, and the maximum is one year. Larger time travel windows are going to use more storage capacity and potentially impact the performance of queries, so that's something to keep in mind. But my understanding is you can't actually turn this feature off. I think it's vital to the way Cockroach works under the hood. So the ability to query the past state of your tables is kind of a nice byproduct of that. YugabyteDB doesn't really have an analog to these point in time queries. Like most cloud database offerings, it does have a point in time recovery feature that's quite a bit different from being able to, on a whim, query arbitrary past states of the database without affecting the current state. Look, for most applications, point in time queries are not going to be an essential feature but I'm sure there are some that can make good use of it. So all this taken into account, are these databases good alternatives to what came before? Databases like DynamoDB and Postgres? Yes, definitely. Can they be seen as potentially being the new default choice for new applications over something like Postgres? Possibly. So far, I wasn't able to find a good reason to stick with vanilla Postgres, especially given that the minimum cost for RDS Aurora Serverless V2 is about $42 a month. That's even if you're not storing any data or receiving any traffic. RDS Aurora isn't really vanilla Postgres, but it's pretty close. Thankfully, DynamoDB has a pretty generous free tier and it's got all the horizontal scalability that you could possibly want. But the query capabilities are less flexible than what SQL provides, so your use case really has to be a good fit for it to make it a viable option. Both Yugabyte and CockroachDB have free options. CockroachDB actually has a free tier that's pretty generous. It has 10 gigabytes of storage and 50 million request units per month. I was able to create a cluster and start working with it in a few minutes. I was also really impressed with the whole new user experience. It kind of made me want to stick with them even if I grow out of the free tier. I'm not exactly sure how many reads and writes 50 million request units equates to, but I suspect that if you're a founder, you aren't going to be paying anything until you have actual users, which is really nice. Yugabyte actually does have a free option that you can use to test it out but that isn't obvious from looking at the pricing page. Now, discerning viewers might notice there is another serverless Postgres compatible offering called Neon. On the surface, Neon is pretty interesting, but I wasn't able to squeeze it into this video. It takes an approach that sounds quite a bit different from how Yugabyte and Cockroach do things. Let me know in the comments what you think of Neon if you have some experience with it. Okay, so given all of this, do I plan to use vanilla Postgres and DynamoDB anymore? Vanilla Postgres, probably not, unless the project is really small. I'll probably still use DynamoDB for some things, but only if the access patterns fits its limited query capabilities. And of these two databases, CockroachDB and YugabyteDB, which one is better? I'm not really sure. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see a performance comparison using a really large data set that really pushes the boundaries of the automatic sharding and load balancing. Both have great user interfaces, both were easy to set up, both have pretty compelling narratives around automatic sharding and horizontal scaling. If you're really agonizing over the decision, I have a crazy idea. An idea that probably isn't practical in most scenarios. But Try both. Have your application do all its reading and writing to both databases concurrently. Instrument the code to record performance metrics. Use whatever response comes back faster and hand that off to the user, but complete the slower of the two queries so you can save the performance metrics. At some point, you'll get a clearer picture of which database is better for your needs, either through analyzing the performance metrics or maybe because you discover a nice feature in one that isn't the other. Let me know in the comments if you think that's a crazy idea. It probably is. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I hope it gave you a good look at the SQL X crate and that you're a little better equipped next time you have to choose a database for a project. I do realize there are other databases out there with similar features. PlanetScale and SurrealDB are the ones that come to mind. I do have a dedicated video about SurrealDB, so definitely check that out if you're into newer cutting edge databases. Their hosted product is still in beta at the time I'm making this video, but Things are looking pretty promising so far. Or if you want to explore more about how to build applications that can scale to handle massive amounts of data and traffic, definitely check out this video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.